Mic check one, two, mic check one, two. Okay. Okay. We are live. Well, a, sc a screen is doing something. Wait a minute. We're almost live. Oh, Facebook is loading. Let me just give it a second. Facebook is getting ready to stream. My phone is ringing off the hook. I don't know why. I'm going to have to ignore that. It may be her. No, this is, this, these, are, these are not. I got his number. This is somebody else. Okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome to another session with the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee. Today is July 17th, 2020. We have a, a loaded lineup to share with you some important history and some important dimensions of the legacy of, of our beloved Black Shining Prince, Malcolm X. I am Brother Zaid Muhammad, the founding press officer for the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, and I have the task of walking you through this evening. Uh, so we're certainly glad to have everyone who is tuning in with us, everyone who has been tuning in with us since we have gone into this COVID-covered cyberspace challenge, um, and we've done some good things. We want to thank everybody who was with us on May 19th. Over 6,000 people chimed in from all over the world to give love and appreciation for Malcolm on May 19th through the lens that we shared on that evening. And I'm supremely grateful for all of you who chimed in and supremely grateful for the presentations that everyone made that night. We're good to have Baba Zach Kondo back. Zach was with us on May 19th, as was Ilyasa, Shabazz, right? And I'm going to introduce everybody in a moment. Um, just a few weeks ago, on June 28th, we uh, did another webinar to appreciate the founding of the OAAU in, in Harlem. Uh, and that, on its own, that garnered some 2,000 views uh, in our first look. Uh, and we really started beginning to look at, you know, Malcolm's Pan-Africanism Pan dimensions. And we're going to expand on that again today, Ju July 17th, because today is the anniversary that Malcolm's epic memorandum to the Organization of African Unity was presented on behalf of 22 million Afro-Americans, and it was nothing like that has really happened on, on, with, these, with those dimensions and on that scale since then. Malcolm truly was uh, a diplomat for our struggle, and it is indeed it is his diplomacy as well as his le legendary organizing and, and oration that made him indeed our Black Shining Prince. So we're going to spend some time unpacking uh, that hugely important uh, the mention of those legendary trips abroad. And the, the only one tends to get spotlighted, and that's the the the, the, his, the one that included his legendary Hajj. But the, the that third trip abroad after Hajj, he spent some five months abroad, most of that time in Africa, really, really trying to put down some groundwork for really taking our struggle into the world stage. Uh, so we're going to spend some real time with that with some serious guest hitters. The human rights focus of the organization since its inception has always been our political prisoners. Malcolm X Commemoration Committee was started back in 1982 when one Herman Ferguson was just gotten out of prison. And Herman was one of those folks who was with Malcolm in the OAAU who actually tried to go forward doing some of this work after Malcolm fell. And of course, the work that Herman did and that, that incredible generation did, uh, all of them found themselves in the crosshairs of the COINTELPRO operation of the United States government. And Herman ultimately found himself in exile for some over 20 years in Guyana. When he came back and attempted to clear his name, he was sent right to prison. Wow. The late Judge Bruce Wright somehow got hold of his case and let that great black man go. And as soon as he got out, 
He started rounding up some of his comrades and said, we have an obligation to this new generation in this commercial age to, to, to defend and give everybody the real background on who Malcolm was. And I was brought into that from its beginning. And uh, we have been rolling ever since. Uh, May 19th, we did the spotlight for Sundiata Okoli. Sundiata is a COVID survivor in prison. Uh, Sundiata has been in prison now for 47 years. And we're still fighting on his behalf. We were proud of what we were able to develop and raise for him that day. Uh, our past uh, presentation was dedicated to Dr. Matulu Shakur. Uh, Matulu is, is fighting bone cancer as well as fighting for his freedom. And we're glad of what we were able to raise for him. And today we will spotlight Jaleel Muntakim, uh, New York's last Panther political prisoner, in prison for, for 49 years, 49 years, and was on his way out before somebody blocked it. We will get into that in, in, in a moment. But I just wanted to do a short libation statement and name some ancestors that are important to this walk to the, to, and to the ancestor who we celebrate today. I, in, in, in the cause with our tradition, I will start with Malcolm's mother, Ilias's grandmother, Louise Langdon Norton Little, a, a, a multilingual Garveyite, serious black woman, right? Uh, pioneer as all those Garveyites were. His father, Earl Little, a uh, brave, strong black man who stood up in the, in the face of some of the most dangerous times to be a stand-up black man in this country, at that time that they were adults and trying to raise a family. A shame. Uh, that ultimately would cost him his life, right? Uh, Mr. Garvey himself, their leader, uh, one of the most prolific and, and seminal organizing imaginations we have ever known. And, we, and, I, do, and I, I, I shudder to think what Malcolm and, and, and Garvey would have done with the technology that we have at our disposal today as organizers. We would be in an incredible place. I oh, had access to that. Uh, some, of the, or some of the ancestors that were part of those important trips and that work that Malcolm was doing in Africa. Professor Shirley Graham Du Bois. A oh, shame. Okay. Known as the wife of W.E.B. Du Bois, but she was a serious scholar, anthropologist, master teacher, and revolutionary in her own right, and played some very important roles in, in the development of those important networks that Malcolm was trying to pull together. And that picture that Alice Wyndham has given us of him and Shirley together is a classic and a very important moment. Her son, David Du Bois, who was in Egypt at the time, and of course, oh, this memorandum was delivered in Egypt, right? And, and, and David was a part of a network of, of, of African Americans who were in Egypt at that time, and including Elijah Muhammad's son, who, was, uh, that, who had also come out against his father's old teachings, uh, who was a student at Al Azhar University um, at that time. And, and I was actually trying to reach David around the time he passed away to try and include him in some of our presentations. Um, Vicki Garvin, oh, Harlem sure. legend, uh, and some of us in this, in this panel actually knew Vicki quite well. Vicki was a part of those conferences that, that Professor Abdul Kalimat and, and Bill Sales put together some years ago. But Vicki goes back to the 40s with the Robesons of the land and, 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 and you know, was a legendary organizer. She was very much in Ghana and in between Ghana and China during that period and is, and is an unsung Harlem legend in terms of our black radical tradition. And, and, and Maya Angelou was probably oh, the best known out of uh, all of those folks who were involved in that time. And Maya was quiet as this kept was getting ready to relocate back to the States to help Malcolm organize the OAAU he was taken from us. Maya is one of the few folks that can say that she worked with Malcolm and with Martin. And of course, just when she was trying to get in gear for each of them, they were both taken from us. Um, just a minute ago, we lost Nelson Mandela's daughter, and that's my generation. Oh, shame. I think that was a bit of a surprise. Sister Zinzawa Mandela just, just left for the ancestors just a moment ago. And then Ilias, I think you knew her, right? I didn't, I didn't get a chance to, 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 to meet uh, any of his family, but um, that was quite a shock to a lot of us. Uh, and she walked tall in, in a very Mandela way. Uh, and she, that was quite a loss to our people in South Africa and to our people in the Pan-African world. 
So with that, let's move forward. Um, I'm going to start with uh, our, our beloved daughter, Valerie Haynes, from the Northeast Political Prisoner uh, uh, Coalition to, to give us uh, some background and, and the spotlight what was so urgently needed on behalf of Jaleel Muntakim. Valerie, the mic is yours. You can begin. Thank you, Baba Zaid. Peace, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Can y'all hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, I just, made, I just wanted to make sure. So thank you again, um, Baba, for inviting me here to speak, speak on this platform with all these um, veterans of the struggle. Um, so as Baba said, I'm a part of the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition, and we're a community organization based in New York City. We're a collective of uh, community activists and former power, um, PPs and POWs. And we form, say Kuo Diga formed this coalition because he wanted to bring a comrades home. So we support, we advocate for, and bring the voices of our PPs into all spaces as, you know, as many as we can. So I'm going to be speaking about Jaleel Musa King tonight. The spotlight's on him. Um, Jaleel Musa King is a former Black Panther elder. He's been in prison uh, since he was 19 years old. He joined the party at 16. He got recruited to the underground at 18, and he was captured at age 19. And Jaleel's 68 years old. He'll be 69 in October. And his case, and particularly, you know, in the wake of COVID-19, when Jaleel, um, when this first started happening in April, him and his, his legal team, they went to court and filed a petition. And they filed the petition to get released, temporary medical release, because of COVID-19. Because he's an elder, he has pre-existing conditions, hypertension, respiratory issues. So in April, a judge in Southern County, New York State, she granted his release. However, his release was blocked by Attorney General Tis James a black woman who, uh, you know, she's, um, she was um, elected by the people, you know, and her whole platform was built on civil rights and human rights. However, she blocked this man from coming home. So uh, the New York, New York State, State Department of Corrections, um, they were able to keep him in prison and he's back in prison and he still has COVID-19 and he's suffering for the repercussions of that. So right now, we have a major campaign. We have a couple of major campaigns. We have a petition to Governor Cuomo because Jaleel applied for um, commutation of sentence in October two, 2019 after he, his 13th parole denial. So Jaleel got parole um, denied 13 times since 2002. Mm. So at this point, we have a petition online asking him to grant Jaleel's commutation of sentence. We also have a petition to Anucci from New York State Department of Corrections to grant him medical parole. So those are the action items that NEPPC has been working on. Um, in addition, we've been doing Twitter storms and social media campaigns to push people to call and tweet the governor and um, tweet um, Anthony Anucci from New York State Department of Corrections. And I believe my time is up. But no, well, no, let's, 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 wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. Okay. How sick did Jaleel get? We understand that his lung capacity has been compromised considerably. You, you, you're at, you're at liberty to talk about that. Okay. We need so to Jaleel, understand how, how serious this is. Okay. So just to show you how serious, serious it is, when Jaleel was denied the, um, the temporary medical release, on April 27th, they sent him, um, his lawyer put in a, um, a petition to argue the case. And her, she was, um, the case was argued on May 28th. However, on May 25th, he got rushed to the hospital. He had, he had a high fever. He couldn't breathe. Um, and he had a lack of oxygen. So as soon as the judgment came down, and the state took the side of the Department of Corrections that they sent him right back to um, Sullivan, to the infirmary. He was not tested negative for COVID, so he's still COVID positive. He's 69 years old. He has hypertension. 
And now due to this COVID-19, he, now he has a thyroid issue because as a result of his infection. So needless to say, this is an urgent matter. We need to bring Jaleel home. He's been constantly denied parole. And we have to, as a community, put our PPs on the front line. We have to put their freedom and do all that we can, raise our voices any way and anywhere we can to make sure we free our elders. Valerie, thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Bob. Um, on what legal ground did James um, block his, his release? I'm sorry, Brother Zach, I didn't hear you. On what legal ground did, she, did um, James use to block his release? So um, Jaleel filed the habeas corpus in New York State Court, right, Supreme Court? Right. And so the Department of Corrections said that due to um, the type of the type of petition he filed, the habeas corpus, he said he said that Jalil had no right to file that particular petition, and so because of that, the Department of Corrections said no, he he doesn't have to be released because this is the wrong petition. And, so that's the pro okay. And, and so basically, uh huh. So that's a procedural uh, basis. Did the lawyers then re? We apply, or they just left it at that? No, what happened was the, the, the judge and the Supreme Court judge, uh -huh. they, um, they, the case was dismissed. Okay. So they needed to re... Did they, did they re-petition? No, because it has to be a whole other petition. It can't... It's like they have to do the whole thing over. So, right. that's, why, right, so that's why right now, our, our, our position is that we, the people, the organizers, the advocates for Jaleel, we have to push the issue of him coming home because, you know, there's always the legal and strategy and right. there's always our strategy. So we are pushing Cuomo elected officials to release him ASAP. Okay. Valerie, how can we support you? Right. Okay, so the way that we, you can support us is that we have a petition online, like I said, with Color of a Change. And Baba Zaid will put that in the... Um, that, in the yeah, I was going to tell you to just go ahead and drop it in the chat box. We have a petition. Yeah, we just have a drop petition it in. It's on our page. It's uh, on the page. And I also... Have it on my Twitter page as well. I'm sorry, Zaid. And also, we have a, a tweet storm. So we, we also would like people to write letters of support for his parole. His next parole hearing is in September. So we're, we're asking people to write parole letters to support him. And I'll also put that information in the chat. Okay. Let's unpack it. Let's unpack it a little more, and then, yeah. then we'll get into the body of our program. Valerie, thank you. Jamil is, is the surviving, the last of the New York Three political prisoners. Back in 1971, him and uh, Albert Noel Washington and Herman Bell were charged with the killing of two New York police officers, right? And they were all given life sentences. Uh, we lost. Noor, we, we call him Sheikh Noor because he, he be, developed a very strong relationship with Islam, just as like we, you know, like we described here with Malcolm. Uh, Sheikh died in prison in 2000, right? Herman was released on parole several years ago. Uh, these men, when they were in prison, they were model prisoners, right? And, and there's, there's written, beyond that, they were calling tell targets who were framed for what they were charged with. That's, we need to be clear about that. But the, beyond that, they did their time. They did their time. And they should have been released, right? Before Herman was released, he was attacked by six correction officers and was subjected to a beating that nearly killed him at 69 years old, right? Because they knew his release was looming, right? And, and their attack, of course, was minimized, uh, but he ultimately got out. The outrage that came from law enforcement quarters over Herman's release is, is, is part of what's blocking Jaleel's release, right? This one got out. We're not going to let this one get out. So we basically have law enforcement along with some old racist baggage in the courts resentencing uh, our political prisoners to death by abusing parole. Most of our political prisoners who have been in on this walk with the Black Panther Party and, and similar formations have done their time. 
and just as a matter of law should be released. I got a lawyer in the mix. He can back this up, right? So, 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 you know, this is an abuse of authority, uh, as was their frame ups. And, uh, you know, our, our community needs to reclaim our freedom fighters so we don't lose any more in the clutches of the state, right? So, uh, we will have that information on our page, right? The Twitter campaign is, is every week, right? Uh, Governor Cuomo, for all of the points that he has gotten, uh, becoming a media darling in the face of this COVID crisis in relationship to the monster that is Donald Trump. Let's, let's, let's deal with Mr. Cuomo and his baggage, right? Mr. Cuomo had all of the sanitizing equipment and, 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 and material and, and hand washing and whatnot, all that made by prisoners, but hasn't released a single prisoner in a place where this thing is festering like no other place it could fester and there, there's a, this is a part, there's, a, there's a national campaign to release aging prisoners who were at risk for this disease with all of the pre-existing conditions and who pose no threat to society and who have done their time. He has not released not one, right? So, so while we are giving him a pass in relationship to Mr. Trump, we need not be too generous because there's some things that he can do that are contradicting his liberal profile, to put it mildly. We are angrily disappointed that with Letitia James. Letitia James is attorney general for the state of New York because of people like Jaleel Musa King. And we are outraged that she would do something like that. And she too needs to be spoken to by the black community and reminded of how she got to where she is if she wants to stay there for a minute, right? So I got to get that in so we can text contextualize properly just what we're talking about when we're trying to free Jaleel Munta King. Valerie, thank you very much. Right? You're welcome. Me? Thank you. Yes, Bobby, what's your Twitter account, just in case? Oh, Zaid Powers for me. NDPC one. Right. What is it? Say that again. NEPCC. Sorry, NEPPC one. N for Northeast. PP for political prisoners, C for coalition, any PPC, the number one. Right on, right on. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Now, let me just give an overview of our guests. Uh, and Valerie just put it in the chat box. Very good. Right. Uh, Michael Ferguson just joined us from, from our organization. Boy, his father, Michael's our treasurer. Right. We're still waiting for Herb, Mr. Boyd. Uh, with the, one of the long distance runners on his pre presentation. <laughs> now let me just, just go over what we're going to do tonight. Um, I have as a special guest co-host King Downing from WBAI. And King, of course, is a history long, long that goes long before his newfound relationship with WBAI and the morning show. But King has been, been on this walk for, for some decades uh, and uh, going back to the, the, the twilight of the Black Panther Party in the Boston area. And we need to really talk about it, King, because I've actually trying to lay some groundwork to do some things in the Boston area also, you know. Um, King was supposed to interview Ilyasa and Herb uh, yesterday morning on the morning show. But of course, we're not in studio the way we normally are, you know, in, 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 in non-COVID times. And, and because of some tech challenges, he could not, uh, the, the, their interruption, the, the, their interview was interrupted. And, and, and they were just getting ready to get into it. So Herb was really getting ready to roll. So uh, I asked King to come along and to, to, you know, to do the opening part of our program by, by doing his interview with Ilias and Herb. Now, Herb has not gotten the board. We have not heard from Herb. We hope he's okay, right? But uh, bef King, before you have your questions and, and, and start your conversation with Ilias, let me introduce everybody else. Mm -hmm. Round out tonight's discussion, I have Baba Zach Kondo, Zach has given us the definitive take on Malcolm's assassination, conspiracies unraveling the assassination of Malcolm X. And I can remember the days when we were both young, young men, you know, <laughs> in our way uh, on this walk. Uh, and, and, and I was very proud to bring this young man to Newark and to New York, right, uh, to pre make his presentation on that. And we've had the honor of standing up to uh, the nation of Islam trying to intimidate him <laughs> from doing that didn't that did not work. 
Yeah, he's I saw that one. on shoulders on fearless ancestors, <laughs> you're going to be fearless, you see? And this, this, this brother stood his grounds on the strength of some stellar work, right? And uh, he's very important to this work. And, and the work that he has been doing in grounding young men, right, uh, is something also that we need to talk about with him more often. And then, then of course, we finally have Professor Abdullah Kalimat, well, along with Professor Bill Sales, those were the conspiring field slaves that gave us Malcolm X speaks in the 90s. Legendary conferences that, were, that uh, inspired interest in Malcolm all over the world. So inspirational that the Cuban, the Cuban our folks in the Cuban Revolution had to have their own to add to it. Uh, and had all y'all come down to Cuba, that was incredible. Uh, we had so many more people who were close to Malcolm during that time who were still with us, like Dr. John Henry Clark, like your mother, Sister Elias, Dr. Betty Shabbat. Betty was still very much with us then. You know, uh, Alex Haley, all of the, all, Vicki Garvin, all of those folks were still around. And the work that we got out of that process was incredible, right? And I want everybody to appreciate brothermalcolm.net where all of that stuff is. And that is the resource guide, I would dare say, online for, for our beloved Black Shining Prince, right? They will be, they will add to this discussion and give, give you the importance of Malcolm's revolutionary trips abroad or his, i.e., diplomacy, right? Um, and of course, her board should be along soon. We hope we can get her. We haven't heard back from him, but we hope we can get him. So, um, Ilyasa Shabbat. Was just about to start. Five, five <laughs> books in the last six years. Output has been incredible, right? This I really appreciate what you've been, right? You've been a stellar example. You continue to be a stellar example, inspiring all of us. And your, your, your impact you're having on our young is is, is profound. Uh, my favorite picture of you. I have a picture of you with a with a child at one of your readings for, for one of your children's books. That is that is powerful. It's just powerful. So uh, uh, we'll let you do your introductory remarks and, and, and what brought you to make your contributions to this dimension of your father's legacy and why it's important. And we, we, we've got uh, two serious guns right behind you to, to, to help you to help us all amplify this. So, so, so my dear sister and queen, the floor is yours. Well, first I want to say that it's really such an honor for me to be in the presence of each of you. Um, you know, I'd like to say that it's like minds, uh, you know, I think it was Abdul, Professor Abdul Kalimat, <laughs> who thought that we were all the same age. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're close to it. But it's such an honor to be around strong, empowering, uh, informed brothers and sisters that's doing the work. When I was, for as long as I can remember, mentoring young girls um, while in high school and then in college and, and then as a professor, uh, what was important to me was to see young people um, have the opportunity for self-love. And it was something that my mother gave each of her daughters and it is the reason why I set out to do children's books. I mean, I, I did do Growing Up X um, and another book, but it was really important for me to have Malcolm Little as a book for young children, young people, to just open up a book and see a positive reflection of themselves and also to put my father's childhood in proper context. And... Um, and really that has been the reason that I've done the work that I have, because I realized that there were, you know, it's funny when you grow up in your household, you think everyone is like your parents, you know? And then when you discover that they're not, you know, it, it, it's, it's such, you know, it's a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that the world is so complicated, it is even more of a, horrific awakening. And, and so, um, and likely why in my older age, now that I'm coming close to your age, brother um, Abdul, that, <laughs> that it's important for me to, to be in the company and the presence of 
um, people like you, you know. You're muted, Zaid. Oh. So I want you to, you know, just just just, just go. You got more time. Uh, we want oh. you to talk a little bit more about what you've done because you've brought uh, a lot to the appreciation of your father's legacy, particularly on this walk in terms of his trips abroad, right? Uh, I want you to, I, I'd like to also hear your, you talk about, if you will, uh, one, of the, one of the unsung appreciations of, of your father came from James Baldwin, right? And in Baldwin's piece, it actually had me thinking more about your father's childhood as well, right? And, and in one of my pieces, that is a piece that I wrote for that that engagement that we had with Zach and, and, and um, Carl Evans and whatnot many years ago that inspired that. Um, so I, you, you, you've got more to say to us. You've got more to say about what you've done and what was important for you to bring forward to your father's legacy. Give him right, yeah. right. Uh, uh, Mr. King, would you like to ask me some questions specifically? <laughs> <laughs> she called me Mr. Mr. is my father, but yes, I'd love to. I'd love to. Brother, Brother King, I talk to you on the phone a lot. You know, know. I'm, I'm just happy to see your face. I'm happy to see yours because yeah. we've done it all voice, including, uh, including on the radio. But yeah, I'd be, I'd be honored to. So uh, first, first, I wanted, of course, to say it was great to talk to you again. And I'm sure you've experienced this, but it seems to me that people are drawn to you. I mean, they're really drawn to you. And of course, they're drawn to you for your works. And we have talked about them and we're going to talk about them in the future. I think they're also drawn to you to get a glimpse of Malcolm X and to get a glimpse through your life, but also through his life and the fact that you had that intimate contact with him. So I wanted to focus right in on the, on the diary and the section that dealt with his international travel. What was your impression when you first looked at or touched those pieces? Okay, so um, Zaid, are you listening? So now you know what the, the issue is with the diary. We were going to allow uh, Brother Herb to yeah. talk about it. I didn't get a chance to brief King on that. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I knew that that was going to happen because that's what happened in our interview. But I just meant, I was asking about the personal part, really, really focusing on what was your impression when you saw them, his writing, these were papers that he handled. So that now, part. This is a lawyer trying to work around that. No, she 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 know from the interview. <laughs> Always blame the lawyer until you need one. That's the way it works. <laughs> well, I, you know that's real. Again, that is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I can say is, um, you know, to think of this young man who made such an enormous contribution and impact globally. He was only in his 20s when the world learned of him. And he was 39 when he was gunned down. And that was 12 years to make such an enormous in impact. And, you know, when I made my hash, when I went abroad, I thought that, you know, I had to put it in perspective, put it in context that here my father grew up in the Jim Crow era. When Black people were called Negroes, right? Didn't know who they were. Were, were very much uh, mistreated, um, you know, to the highest power, but struggling with having human rights, his human rights recognized in America. And to, I was grateful that he was able to go abroad and experience his manhood, experience his humanity, you know, be honored, be respected uh, amongst um, other leaders, or the other global leaders, dignitaries, heads of state. Um, and, you know, more importantly, to look at what he was um, searching for, solutions, right, to the human condition that wanted to uh, continue to do the things that they had been doing to us for so long. Um, 
so, you know, I just remember being grateful that he was able to travel and to experience his Hajj, to experience that moment of reprise, um, to say the least. Is, is there anything that you, you learned about him through his, his style of writing, the, the, the way he, you know, he, the way he put his thoughts on paper, just the look and feel of it? I think what I learned more was him being so vulnerable, you know, his mm -hmm. humanity, because he was a very young man and, and he was fighting a really, a big monster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in spite of that, he gave it his best shot. And even when he could have stayed, you know, and knowing that there were people lying in wait to kill him, that he chose to return, you know, that he chose to um, plant and, and as many seeds as possible. One of the things that I discovered in my next book that's coming out, The Awakening, when he was in jail, is that he was in... Um, Norfolk County, which was a, a exemplary uh, experimental facility where it was like a, a, a college, right? Dormitories, just, you know, it was a, 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 a far cry different than the Charlestown prison that he was in, which was horrendous. And he chose to leave this great facility once he had been equipped with all of this information about his identity, he chose to go back to this horrible prison so that he could give those same seeds to his fellow um, inmates that he had left, you know? And so it just speaks volumes to his humanity and his commitment. Uh, so for me, it's always seeing his humanity and, 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 and understanding that Look, he was 39 years old when he was gunned down. So what about when he was 30? What about when he was 32 and 35 and walking alone after he left the Nation of Islam? You know, that that was, it had to have been quite difficult for him. And then to have a firebomb thrown in the nursery where, you know, my sister Atala Kabila, with, where, they, where his baby slept, you know, how ruthless. Yeah. And so you can just imagine, you know, so I'm always going to, that side of my father. And uh, uh, as you made, as you did your travels, and in, and in knowing how he reflected, did you find any yourself in the diary, or did anything about him come to you as you were doing your international traveling? You know, I again, I always focused. I mean, yes, he did am amazing work, right, and and inspired many people and learned a lot and brought it back, you know, to share with us. But I always go to focus on, you know, his, his sense of loneliness, you know, feeling like he was alone in the world. And, and that if we know this, you know, all of what he was sacrificing, it should teach us that when we have new leaders that are doing great work, the importance of surrounding and, and, and keeping them protected and, you know, and, and, and supportive and all of those things. I, I think that's so poignant for you to say that because there are many people who say that is part of their political work that we have to protect each other, but they don't have the personal, they don't have the personal connection to it. And so I hope that we're able to get that message out uh, more often because it completely gets overlooked as we're in the middle of this in the middle of this battle. And right. when, when Valerie is talking about Jaleel, it's the same thing, free Jaleel and all the political prisoners. But um, can, you, can you translate that into you know, what you see, how, how these documents can get that message out to this next generation? Right. Well, I think we have to you know, clearly be strategic in whatever we're doing. We have to have a plan. We have to you know, not just march and, and make noise uh, for the moment, but that we're marching and making noise with a purpose so that at the end of our making noise, we've accomplished some goals. And it seems that we need a little more power. And, and so it speaks 
to the urgency of coming together of, you know, of understanding uh, who we are, understanding our history, putting that in context for our children and, and for others, you know, just that we're honoring our ancestors and we're putting our, we're taking control of our uh, narrative, you know, our uh, history and everything else. My father said only a fool will sit back and allow his enemy to teach his children. So we have to take mm. responsibility mm. of that ourselves. And I think when we, it seems like this younger generation, thank God, you know, that they are really getting it together. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we are nurt nurturing them uh, properly and having intergenerational discussions. Like, it's great to have Valerie on and, and everyone. Um, yeah. So, oh, brother, brother Zaid, I was taught to quit while you're ahead, and uh, you know that this might be this might be a great note to leave it on. But of course, uh, sister, if you have anything that you you want to add or bring up at any point in time, feel free. But thank you for that. Thank that you. was very moving, very moving. Yeah, King, I like King. I like where you took it, right? Because one of the things that that you did, Eliasa, with your work is that, and it's something that your father was always concerned with, and that is, you know, when you're in the media constantly, in a media that demonizes our people, you're demonized. And your humanity is not known through that, through those, through those windows, right? And uh, I, I'm glad that I got to meet and do some things with Mr. Haggins, his former photographer, mm -hmm. right? Before he left and I had, we had did what we call the Malcolm X Ancestral Memory Project. That's how Herman pulled me into the community. Uh, and, and the work that he did and, and, and the work that all of you have done since then, you know, to unpack the, the legendary humanity of your father. You know, I had these ancestors whose names we call, we don't call them just because, you know, they, they made noise. We call, right. we call on them because of the, the bigness, the greatness of their humanity and their love for our people, mm -hmm. right? So, so that, I want to appreciate that all around, you know, and I want that, that dimension of your work to be appreciated also. All right. You know what, also for our younger people, it does speak to the role and the importance of, you know, the father, the mother, and planting those seeds in their children. That there is a, you know, like for my father, you know, was this fictitious story that he went to jail and miraculously became Malcolm X, where it was because of his mother and because of his father. Mm -hmm. So it speaks to the importance of that, that we don't you know, and, um, and that if we aren't nurturing, guiding, protecting our children, what can happen? And, and, and that's, um, you know, my book, Ex a Novel, you know, when you don't have the guidance and the support of the, the um, community around you, the village uh, around you that, you know, we see what can happen to our children, especially looking at the mass incarceration there's a young brother that engaged me on Twitter, uh, calls himself Mr. K, uh, about the work of Jan Carew, right? And Jan, was, Jan made the point of making us appreciate your, your grandmother mm -hmm. on your father's life, right? And, you, and on your whole family's life and in our, in our struggle, you know, because right. she was in the midst, she was a pioneer in our struggle, you know? That's right. Paid the price for that. That's right. You know? uh, that, that, you know, the things that make us who we are in our culture, you know, should never be taken for granted or, or taken lightly, right? right? And, and, and we are all children of our, our mothers, right? And, uh, and, and, and you know, we, we, we're in the midst of several generations of strong black women who are mothers that we're talking, talking about. So, 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 so thank you, okay. thank, thank you, creator for your mother and for your grandmother, right? For, for what they have been to us and for what they have been to you. So, um, Baba Zach, you've written extensively about what those trips abroad meant to the national security state and meant to the African world. We give it your turn to take a few minutes to kind of unpack that for our audience. Okay. Well, a couple of things that I think are fundamental. Can everybody hear me okay? You're fine. You're fine. Okay. A couple things that are fundamental as you begin to deal with Malcolm and the African world. The first one is that when Malcolm was in the nation, people, people, people,
people probably didn't realize this, but you know, Malcolm had issues with the Asiatic origins of African people that was part of the mythology, if you will, of the nation of Islam. And, you know, if you study Malcolm's speeches, you know, going all the way back to the 50s, you know, he talked about that a lot less than other ministers and other, you know, officials. And I think that the reason that we need to bring this to the fore is because despite the Asian centeredness of the nation of Islam, Malcolm always had an African center. And I think that's why he, he pretty much kept that part of that, you know, of that, you know, ideology kind of like under, under wraps. The other thing that I think we also want to mention, you know, just as a fundamental element, when we talk about Malcolm X, is that Malcolm did not embrace Pan-Africanism once, you know, after he left the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X was, was the Pan-Africanist before and while he was in the Nation of Islam, and in many ways that created some of the problems that he had with Elijah Muhammad, because Elijah Muhammad was not a Pan-Africanist. Elijah Muhammad didn't, you know, had issues identifying. And in fact, I remember when I was doing some research years ago, I remember I came across a, an article that was published. If memory serves me, it was, it was, it was, it was June 1968 in Muhammad Speaks. And what he was basically doing was he was chastising. In fact, truth be told, I think it was actually June the 28th because it was the same day that the, you know, OAAU was founded. But at any rate, he was chastising in the article. Elijah Muhammad was chastising his followers who were wearing foreign outfits. And the foreign outfits were African clothes dashikis, head wraps, things like that. And in his mind, those were foreign clothing as opposed to it being part of our historical heritage. Well, Malcolm, you know, that was the Nation of Islam. That was Elijah Muhammad. But Malcolm's consciousness when it came to identifying with Africa, when it came to identifying with, with Pan-Africanism was much different than that. Even before he left, the nation of Islam. So anyway, those were two fundamental points that I wanted to make. The other thing that I also want to make, which I just technically is probably fundamental as well, is that Malcolm, and I think the diary showed this real well, and the way that, you know, that, uh, you know, y'all edited did a good job of this as well, is that, keep this in mind, Malcolm maintained a very interesting dualism when it came to Islam and when it came to Africa. And, you know, he looked to the Islamic world for his religious and for his spiritual development, but he looked to the African world politically, economically, socially, culturally. In other words, the African world is where Malcolm recognized we as a people needed to embrace, needed to identify with. So when he was in, you know, Africa for so many months, you know, during 1964, Malcolm was basically building those bridges with Africa. He didn't look to Saudi Arabia when he was dealing with, you know, issues that involved African people in the United States. He looked to African countries. He didn't have conferences with some of the Arab leaders, you know, who he embraced as his brothers because of Islam. He didn't have conversations with them about the plight of Africans on a serious level. He had those conversations with the Nkrumahs, with the Sekou Torres, you know, with the Azikwes, with the African leaders, because Malcolm understood that as much as, you know, Islam was important to his development, when it came to his people and when it came to basically the empowerment and liberation of his people, he needed to basically stay home. And that's where Africa, you know, with his pan-African base, with his African centeredness, that's where that basically, you know, you know, comes to the fore. And then the other thing uh, that I always like to just remind people 
one of the things that drew me to Malcolm X was his level of consciousness. We have so few leaders in our history who, when you look at their times, when they lived, the issues that they struggled with, we have very few leaders who have the conscious, excuse me, who have the consciousness level that Malcolm X had. And like his daughter was saying, to be so young, you know, I mean, I'm, I mean, to be as young as he was, and yet to see things that other African leaders and intellectuals and scholars, or as Hakeem Adabudi would call, uh, liberated intellectuals, to basically see things that a lot of these people never could see because of his perceptivity, because of his level of consciousness, in so many ways, it put Malcolm in a category all by himself. And that was one of the things, you know, when I was reading his autobiography and then I started reading his speeches and, and uh, some of the other things, that was just one of the things that just kind of blew me away. It was like, I, I remember, you know, uh, when I was young saying stuff like, damn, why didn't I see that? How could, how could I couldn't see that? How did he see that? You know, that, that, that always amazed me um, when he came to, uh, to Malcolm X. And of course, the fact that he identified with Africa and the fact that he spent so much time in Africa, of course, was one of the things that brought the United States government who already, and let's be real clear on this. Malcolm was a threat to the United States, even if he never set foot abroad. If he would have just stayed in the United States, he was a major threat during his time period for his domestic radicalism. And I think sometimes we forget that. You know, people say, well, he became a threat to the enemy when he decided to do the UN, when he decided to connect Africans here with Africans, you know, on the continent. No, Malcolm was already a threat just based upon his domestic politics. And uh, we've been talking about the counterintelligence program. Well, let me put that in some context as well. Now, there were five major counterintelligence programs between 1954 and 1967. Now, the first was, of course, the um, Communist Party USA. That was, that was in 1956. Uh, and they targeted the Communist Party and pretty much destroyed. The FBI counterintelligence program destroyed the Communist Party USA. The next one was 1961. That was the Socialist Workers' Party. And the Quarantel Pro basically destroyed the Socialist Workers' Party in the United States. And then the next one was the White Hate, the KKK one. And they destroyed that so bad that half of the KKKs that were in existence in 1964, half of them, the FBI totally controlled them. Now, why do I mention this? I mention this because the counterintelligence program that focused primarily on African people was 1967, two years after Malcolm had been assassinated. But what we got to remember is that all of the tactics that the enemy was using in 1967 against you know, African people, they were already using those things with Malcolm X in its disruption campaign against the nation of Islam. And I think we forget that. And I just wanted to just remind people. So let me get back to the point I was making. The enemy of our people, Malcolm was a threat to the power structure of the United States, whether he had left the United States or not. And they, from the early, well, actually, the late 1950s to the early 1960s, the enemy was using hook and crook to first separate Malcolm from the Nation of Islam, and then to create, and then to exploit the differences between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm and the national leadership. And so, ultimately, of course, all of this is going to play a role in Malcolm's assassination. But as far as Africa is concerned. Malcolm simply multiplied the threat that he posed once he did, in fact, leave the country. He multiplied. But the enemy already had Malcolm on its list, whether he left 
uh, the United States or not. Absolutely. Let us remember that it was his organizing that made the nation what it became. The nation went through its golden age as a consequence of all that legwork it gets that he put in. We that you know the Malcolm the organizer is the underappreciated legacy of a uh, dimension of his legacy that 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 rubs me the wrong way. And that in, 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 in my last breath that I'm trying to get over to young people as they need to pursue the question of organizing and being able to distinguish that between organizing and mobilizing. Right. right. Malcolm was indeed the quintessential organizer that gave the nation its best days, its best looks, its best work. No question about that. And and and, and teaching black men to stand up to be totally unafraid to this to this beast. Uh, he was he was a threat for a long long time before he set foot abroad. Absolutely, we concur with that a thousand percent. Professor Abdullah Kalimat, we're ready for your insight, sir, in terms of Malcolm as a legendary uh, bastion of international human solidarity that he is and and was. The floor is yours, sir. First of all, let me just say thank you for inviting me to be part of this. This is a very important forum, uh, and uh, we need many more like them. I'd like to really make three points. The first point is about context, because I think it's important as much as we look at Malcolm as an individual, it's really important to have some historical context to understand why and how the world was in motion during that time. Then secondly, uh, it's important for us to even go back over what most of us know, but we need to think more deeply about, and that is the fundamental revolutionary teachings that he represented. And then lastly, just a point or two on the legacy for us today. With regard to the historical context, it's important to, to remember that after World War II, things changed radically for black people, not only in terms of the workplace and the development of organizations of black workers, but in terms of the fact that the mobilization of people in the post-McCarthy period uh, was really fundamental to, to impacting the politics. So even with the uh, takeover of the leadership of the March on Washington, that was really a fundamental break in terms of the mobilization, the number of people that were mobilized. That was a very important moment. But equally as important was the fact that Black people were rising up in their righteous anger in the cities, whether it was in New York, whether it was in Watts, California, and so on. So the middle 60s, had a lot to do with the mass mobilization of black people. And Malcolm was very much a part of that. We have to remember that what he represented was a tradition where ideas that not only came from his family, but from the movement and from Harlem. So the point Zach was making about Africa, uh, he was reflecting uh, the political culture of the environment in which he was a part of. The, uh, the second point is the fact that the third world was engaged in a revolutionary transformation. Not only did Saudi Arabia recognize Malcolm in terms of state power, but in terms of religion. So you had both those things happening even within Saudi Arabia. Uh, the OAU recognition, uh, the connection to Cuba. Uh, and another <laughs> just anecdote, uh, uh, Babu from Tanzania talks about how when he picked Malcolm up and was taking him to meet with uh, Julius Nereri, uh, they both were commenting on the fact that China had just had an, a nuclear explosion. And so the third world had control of uh, nuclear weapons. And so there was this celebration of the possibilities that the third world represented at that moment. And then lastly, in terms of context, there was a convergence. The convergence of the civil rights movement and the black liberation forces. They weren't the same. They didn't end up, I, I, I don't agree the idea that King and Malcolm were the same uh, at any point, but they certainly were moving in a direction. And that impacted a lot of us who were active, who saw the importance of mass mobilization. We also saw the importance of the strategic thinking of Malcolm. So we have black people changing, we have the third world changing, we have the movement changing. And Malcolm was very much an iconic figure that emerged in all that context. Now, in terms of his thinking, I like to think about those three speeches in Detroit, 63, Message to the Grassroots, 64, Ballad of the Bullet, 65, The Last Message. 
Let's just take a look at some of the content of that. In Message to the Grassroots, he talked about land and bloodshed. What we can get from this is he was focusing on political economy to understand the political economy of a society and the possibility of change. And then bloodshed, he was really talking about confronting state power. Uh, now, how do we know this? He directed us to study seven revolutions. Uh, the, 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 let me just recount them. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the Algerian Revolution, the Kenyan Revolution. In other words, revolutions about capitalism, revolutions about socialism, revolutions about national liberation. In other words, he was a teacher of the revolutionary processes and he was directing us to understand something fundamental. The Ballad of the Bullet. In talking about revolution, he's talking about a strategic orientation. The Ballad of the Bullet addressed the tactical understanding of how to achieve those things. And what's really important at that moment was that he exposed us to the limitations of the electoral process. In other words, it wasn't a question of saying, never look at the electoral process. He was saying, exploit it and understand that when you reach the end of that process, there are other alternatives that has, must be considered if you are in fact part of this revolutionary transformation that he was advocating. And of course, in the last message, he addresses the whole question of the global situation and returns to discuss his experience with the very leaders that Zach was talking about. In other words, he was really telling us to and helping us to see that each one of those situations had to be investigated. And I think if we go to the Oxford speech that he gave at the Oxford Union, and he starts talking about what was happening in the Congo, uh, he begins to address this whole question of neocolonialism. He addresses the, the contradictions among black leadership, et cetera. So it wasn't just a blind, narrow uh, assumption that if you're black, everything's going to be all right. He was really talking about a historical process. And that, that legacy of being an intellectual, uh, but not an intellectual that had a career as an intellectual, but an intellectual activist who was trying to take theory and put it in the context of social motion to transform the society, which really leads to the last point about what the theoretical legacy is. And it seems to me the theoretical legacy is on the one hand, the question of thinking about black liberation, and on the other hand, thinking about class struggle. In other words, when Malcolm talks about being the bottom of the pile Negro, talks about being a field Negro, he's talking in class terms. And those class terms mean Medicare for all. In other words, everybody, uh, freedom for all, housing for all, jobs for all, uh, equality and justice for all, and nothing short of that. And this is something that we have to really remind all our elected officials, all our current leaders. Uh, and we have to even remind the people in the street, this current street force. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I think there's been a retreat, but it's not a retreat that is hopeless, but it's a retreat that has to be encouraged and developed. Uh, so when we get back to the question of Black Lives Matter, who has to be convinced of that? In other words, Black power, the tradition that Malcolm comes out of, begins with an affirmation of self and a positive appraisal of who we are. In other words, I don't have to be convinced that my mama, you know, is uh, uh, her life matter, my life matters. Uh, but if that's where we have to start, uh, we then have to turn away from the audience being the oppressor and start talking about ourselves. The legacy of Malcolm, to me, is not only in us who are here present, but we have to think about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers from Detroit. We have to think about the Black Panther Party. We have to think about the African Liberation Support Committee. We have to think about that revolutionary thrust that constantly happens when we bring the Black Liberation Movement together with the anti-imperialist class struggle aspects to really begin to confront state power. Malcolm became an icon along with Che Guevara, along with Mao Zedong, along with uh, the uh, Chris Hani and other forces in Africa. 
And uh, and that's why we love him so, and that's why we're talking about him right now. And so thank you very much for allowing me to, to make these brief comments. Awesome. Uh, can I um, uh, can I say something? Sure, sure. And yeah. then I'm, I'm gonna have Terrence come in and I'll let each of you do your, your, your clu concluding remarks. Okay, now actually it's, it says more on a, on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, Baba Abdul, you, you wouldn't remember me, but I met you in March 1982 at the National Council for Black Studies in Chicago. And in, and in fact, I was beginning my Malcolm X research and I was, you know, talking to people and, you know, James Turner was there and Leonard Jeffrey was there and, and they would give me people to talk to and stuff like that. But I remember you were, you gave a presentation and I, I, I want to say it may have been a debate because I know um, there was a debate between Karanga and Baraka. And I think you may have been in a debate as well. But anyway, what I wanted to say to you is that I've not only appreciated your work over the years, but I also view you as really one of the pioneers as far as black studies is concerned. And, and I don't know if you get that type of appreciation, but uh, you know, you to me, you know, you're one of those, what, you're one of those giants that I've always appreciated from afar. And so since I haven't had many opportunities to be in contact with you, I just wanted you to, to know that uh, this evening. So thank you for the work that you've done for our people. Well, like a brother I know and grew up with says, I'm just a poor boy trying to make it. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you mentioned Black Studies because uh, I am just finishing, in fact, next week, sending off the final manuscript to a book-length study on the history of Black Studies. Because this is a, you know, we often talk about that talent intent idea. Uh, and the, the intention of that was to grab 10% and say, you all need to serve your people. And right now we have Black Studies, which was one of the great projects of the Black Power Movement. Uh, we have a generation of scholars who unfortunately have delinked from the community and delinked from the movement. They represent institutional resources, they represent money, they represent status. Uh, they could be having a greater impact on the arts. All the black people in the arts could be supported black intellectuals, activists in the street. Think of the hours of research that black studies students do that's unrelated to the actual needs of black people. Mm -hmm. We don't have histories of every black community. We don't have biographies of all the people that have contributed to the black liberation struggle who are gonna be forgotten. There's so many things that Black Studies could be doing. So, you know, those of us that have a responsibility to tell this story, I'm trying to tell something. I hope y'all read the book when it comes out next year. Let me echo that sentiment. And let me just say this too, because I did a little, an ancestor who I should have acknowledged in the libation statement was John Coltrane, mm. right? Mm. The anniversary of John Coltrane leaving and Malcolm and Train were the, were the mm -hmm. fountainheads of what we call Black Studies, mm -hmm. what we call the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to salute what I want. I want to put what, what, what Zach said to you in train language, <laughs> if I could, because y'all deserve that. Y'all absolutely deserve that. <laughs> right on, Zach, for what you said, and right on, sir, for what you've been all these years. We appreciate that. We echo that 1,000%. Now we've got some groundbreaking stuff. We can I, can I ask one question, please? Sure, you can. Hold on. Yeah, um, let, me, let, me go, let me go on mute. You go ahead. At the university now, um, Brother Abdul? Yes. Which university are you located? University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And which department are you in? Uh, I'm in the African American Studies and uh, the Information School. Okay, because I think, are you also on um, Twitter or? I, I, email is my thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have to get you on Twitter. You should get some of your students to do that. And what about <laughs> Brother Zach Kondo? Zach, where are you located? 
<laughs> I'm at Baltimore City Community College. Okay. Because I think a lot of people want to know how to reach you, Baltimore City Community College. Yeah. Wow. Both, both of them are under the radar in terms of, you know, <laughs> you know, virtual reality, you know. But yeah, I, I agree with you, Elias, on that supremely. Now, some groundbreaking work. Los yeah. Angeles, <laughs> Crenshaw Boulevard, yeah. Hood, wants to claim that, wants to claim the black shiny prince. That's right. right. Put their name up on, on that boulevard, right? Brother right. Charles, I want you to give us, tell us a story about that and how far has that campaign gone and how can we help you? And there's some things that we want to talk about when we get finished about some things that we can do to help you out. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. I'm very honored to be a part of this, this uh, historic panel here. Uh, very honored to be around such great activists, educators, uh, community people. And uh, it's, it's a serious pleasure to be in the company of uh, Sister Shabazz, one of the offspring of uh, Minister Malcolm. So I'm here uh, to just say that, uh, you know, since 1995, uh, my organization, which is the Foundation for Arts, Mentoring, Leadership, and Innovation, uh, which is Family Inc., uh, started a campaign to rename Crenshaw into Malcolm X Boulevard. And you can imagine the uproar that we faced back then, uh, not only from the white community, but uh, some well-meaning Negroes <laughs> say that were afraid of that type of move on Crenshaw Boulevard, which has some kind of tradition here that to me is based on a lot of fallacious ideas about culture. And so that in mind, we set out in, in 95 uh, to rename that boulevard. And just recently in the last couple of years, we reignited the effort and of course, with the, the recent phenomenon of the COVID-19 uh, situation and with uh, the phenomenon of George Floyd and all that that means, uh, the, the idea had been reignited. And so we've now come to a point where we have over 1,500 signatures on a petition that we started about six weeks ago. Uh, we have the support of some of the major uh, neighborhood council organizations in the city we have we are approaching the city council uh they have to vote on it of course and so in terms of the technical side of everything that's going on uh, we've made some progress and we we intend to get this done of course with the support of the family which is critically important to us and of course to support the community and we continue to to to, to get the petition signed and to make noise about this and to demand that there's equal respect for all of our heroes that we choose our heroes, that Malcolm is deserving of this kind of honor uh, right alongside his brother, Dr. King. And then symbolically, as, as has been done for many years, I, I actually traveled back in 2002 just to see for myself, this is before the internet, uh, that Malcolm X and Dr. King signed crossing and that Lenox Boulevard had been joined by Malcolm X. And I brought that news back, you know, and that's how serious we have been uh, to, to, to dig into the research and to find out why is Los Angeles so far behind culturally? Well, if you know anything about Los Angeles, I don't have to go into a long you know, speech about that. But there is a conscious community here. There's a progressive community here that wants to see change. And as we talk about the boulevard, we're also talking about uh, a community that is being gentrified right now. And we feel that the strongest thing, the strongest message that we can send is that this is our community. We live here, we work here, we love this, this community, and we want to claim it as our own. We invite everybody here. But being born in New Orleans, Louisiana, I came up in a, a city that's uh, multicultural, so certainly used to that. But no one would come to New Orleans, Louisiana, were it not for black people and what we have produced, the jazz music. I happen to be an artist myself, and so I know the value of our culture from many different sides. And so we want to have a Malcolm X Boulevard run through the heart of the black community and that anybody who comes here will be welcomed by Malcolm and Dr. King and others that we'd like to bring to the fore. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm also a, a, a spiritual uh, child of Sam Cooke, who also was influenced by Malcolm X. And so we want to do a Sam Cooke Boulevard and you know, Paul Robeson Boulevard and Ida B. Wells and Harriet Tubman. And so uh, I, I'm just honored to be here, and I'm very excited to uh, partner with uh, like-minded people, of, of uh, Black people of all, of all over the world, 
Um, and so I could say a whole lot more, but I just want you guys to know that uh, we're, we're on top of this. We're extremely serious about it, and we've made tremendous progress, but we can certainly utilize and benefit from a partnership in partnerships with, with Black people all over the country who are, who are in love with the legacy and the memory of Minister Malcolm X. Thank you, brother. Quick question. I want you, I want you to know that um, these web we we are getting we, our our Facebook page, which is the centerpiece for these webinars. We have a very international following, so folks are looking at these from all over the world, right? So so you're going to get some so you're going to get some support from some quarters that may uh, be a pleasant surprise to you. I'm contemplating a West Coast based webinar to 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 give you some help, to give you some more attention from our end in terms of what we're doing because Malcolm's impact on the West Coast is, is huge. Temple 27 didn't come out of the sky. Right. Right. That man took that Oldsmobile, right? <laughs> all up all across this country and he took it to Los Angeles. That's where Temple 27 comes from. Right. And let me let me get let me get at this before we do our closing remarks. One of the most fiery rediscoveries of Malcolm's speeches is when he's when he's rallying the community as a coalition builder of community organizations, diplomacy, right, around the killing of his comrade Ronald Stokes at Temple 27, right? That's the background of one of his most electric moments as an organizer and as an orator, right, and as a stand-up person who can bring our people together when we needed that, right? And as we're talking about police brutality now, we, we've been battling on that beast for a long time time and Malcolm was one of the first to show us how to do that right so we want to bring all of that together and then with some of that history in, in in due time brother so we got your back we appreciate you thank you much now Zach I heard you trying to get in here what were you trying to ask yeah I just wanted to ask him who is Crenshaw who is Crenshaw named after okay Crenshaw is named after a gentleman called George Lafayette Crenshaw who was a real estate developer and who was a starch segregationist who uh, adhered to uh, the restrictive covenants that kept black people out of this community. So he was a racialist, he was a segregationist. He was not somebody who loved black people. And one of the challenges we have is that the, what I call the boys in the hood uh, uh, generation around the late eighties, early nineties, when that movie came out, embracing Crenshaw in a loving way. Right. They don't understand the history. They don't know, they don't know the history of who this man actually is. And so, and what we're advocating for is not to strip his name down, but we, we're looking at the model in Harlem where Crenshaw would remain uh, because there is Nipsey Hussle, there is Nipsey Hussle uh, Square, you know, there's a, there's a love of Nipsey Hussle and, and all that he represented and all the work that he did. And so we're not gonna strip that down. We just wanna marry that or amend that and add Malcolm to the boulevard. And that's not asking much. In, in, in the big picture, that's not asking much, right? In a climate where folks are taking stuff down, you know, that's diplomacy. So that, you know, folks need to wake up and appreciate that because that could go another way if things get hot. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely, definitely. So as we do closing remarks, and I want everybody to think about what it is that we want to take from this moment looking at Malcolm's legacy to say to our young folks in the streets about where we should be going next, standing on shoulders like Malcolm's. And I want everybody to hold the date that is August 15th. That'll be our next webinar. That'll be a Black August tribute where we will be dedicating the night to political prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz, who is fighting bone can who's fighting um, colon cancer, has been in prison since 1975. So, um, Billy, also we can start with you. You want to give some, some closing remarks? And um, then we'll run on up the line. Yes. No, I don't want to give any closing remarks because I'll be back. <laughs> I want to hear from you know these gentlemen. I'm I'm so inspired. And you, you, but I well, and I'll save my question. Hopefully, everyone will be back the next uh, in August, and I'll save my question for then. Because one of the things I would like to know is how do we get our people who are afraid of acknowledging Malcolm, but that's going to be another time, who are afraid of acknowledging Malcolm to do so. How do we bring Malcolm to the forefront of our work? 
and understand the importance of it. We've but been that's down that road before. We, yeah, we've been down that road before too. So that's that you know that how he, the cycles of history come and go is 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 to be appreciated. Yes, man. <laughs> Baba Zach, you want to give some final, some concluding remarks? Yeah. Um, let me um, let me say something about the question that you had asked, and then I I think I'd like to you know also chime in if if it's okay with with what the sister just asked. Um, your question, Baba, was how can we we give it a message to the young people today? Oh, that was your question. No, but it's a good one. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't the question. <laughs> yes, that's a great. That's yes, a, that's yes. It was a serious question. Right. Yeah. Um. There's a couple things. Um. That that basically come to mind. I think one of the greatest things that we can do, and we've kind of talked about it, you know, during this discussion, is we can never underestimate the importance of teaching our young people from before school to middle school to high school, we must teach them what they need to know. And that's different from what a public school or even a private school basically wants them to know. And so like my first book was The Black Student's Guide. And what I was basically trying to do was to help very, was young people book, to too. integrate their minds. To basically, in other words, what we got to keep in mind is education is a tool that a society uses to orient, to train, to basically condition people to follow certain values, certain principles, practice certain cultures, subscribe to certain ideals. And this educational system here in this country is not designed for us. It's designed to basically miseducate us. So the best thing that we can do right now is to be sensitive to the importance that our young people know the things that we as a people need them to know. And if that means basically, you know, just just pulling people's coattails. We never know the things that we say to young people, you never know what resonates. That's one thing that I've learned. You know, I've met people 20 years later and they say, you know, I went to one of your lectures and you said something and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you know, I don't remember saying it, but the point is, and people, you know, and, and I can attest to this because people have said that to me. You know, I've heard somebody and they inspired me. And so the point is, is that we must be basically vigilant and diligent in, you know, talking to our young people and saying what we can to inspire them to be serious Africans. Right on. Ashe. Ashe. King, I'm going to throw you in this mix. You got, you got something to say. You ain't no rookie. You got to say something to these young folks, too. <laughs> Let me unmute here. No, I appreciate it. I want to thank you for uh, for uh, bringing me on here, and I want to thank everybody who uh, participated. And uh, I have I have three quick ones. Um, the first one is I want to go right to Ilyasa's point, and that is that I feel that we must humanize Malcolm. I think that he he was deified, and for good reason. He his uh, strong external persona was made very clear, but I don't think we ever got a chance to feel in, in contact, this generation I'm saying, get in contact with a human being, because I think that tells young people, yes, you can be a Malcolm too. You can, you can personify him in your work every day, and then you are, you are his legacy. And so I, I really feel for that, Ilyas, and I want to uh, we'll have more conversations about how to humanize and personalize him. The second one is that we must raise up and we must encourage youth culture. And right now, there is a lot of independent art, a lot of independent hip hop, independent fashion 
And we are not putting any of our finances or resources into that. And we're expecting them to somehow not be drawn into the corporate structure when we haven't brought any economic Mm. any economic challenge or competition to draw them towards a collective way of doing and commercializing art. So we've got to reach in our pockets. We know our pockets are thin, but you should see what theirs are like right now. Most of them are unemployed. But even the ones that went to college are out here with nothing. So we have to make sure that, that we encourage that in a real material and financial way. And then the last part is to uh, also raise up Malcolm X's international legacy, because people, this part, and I'm so glad that you brought attention to this, this is the part that has not been given a lot of coverage. He visited these countries, the respect that he got, and how having an international perspective is important, even now as we're seeing the movements that many of us had a chance to benefit from subconsciously even around the world of liberation is beginning to happen in earlier ways than what we saw. And if we can connect young people to their international perspective, they will take leadership the way Tahrir Square led to Occupy. So thank you again. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Abdullah Kalimat, your, your, your remarks? Yeah, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to just uh, make two points. Uh, one is about the word respect, and the other is about the word literacy. You know, one of the great impacts of the Nation of Islam in our community was often the way in which they were taught to respect people. And I remember using the word sir with regard to black people. That was like magical because nobody was regarding black people as sir or mister. Uh, and, uh, and respect for women and just respect in general. And uh, something I should have said at the beginning is uh, I have a lot of respect for everybody on the panel and especially and feel honored and privileged to have an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face with Ilyasha. Uh, so I, I, I value this experience very much. Uh, you know, we're killing each other. You know, there's all kinds of reality to a negative way in which our oppression comes out against each other. You know, we're taught to be against each other. We have to really struggle with that amongst ourselves. And lastly, this question of literacy, in the 60s, I think there was more popular literacy among black people than there is today. And one of the things about Malcolm is in his study groups, they read and studied many newspapers, the Peking Review, they, they read and studied material, study. Uh, and they didn't just study black people, they studied the world. Uh, if you don't study your oppressor, what do you know about what you're up against? Uh, so we have to really develop that sense of study. I remember Tony Montero in Philly, they had a conference on the black radical tradition, sister was being interviewed. She said, we don't need to read no books. You know, there's a serious moment of literacy. Uh, no people that are not literate can be free. And so uh, we have to respect each other and we have to be literate and study uh, to get free. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with, with these. Uh, Leonard Jeffries would call this a pyramid analysis. So this is this is dialectics in an African language, all right? Uh, for our kids who are in the streets, right? All of our the, the full dimension of our movement needs to be studied. The civil rights dimension, the direct action campaigns, and all of those strategies, right? And then the Black Liberation Movement, the internationalizing of our work and understanding the national or the, the, the dimensions of self-determination that is important in our work. And we need to come up with a, a, a synthesis in order to move that forward, a, a, a synthesis to move that, that forward on, the, on that third leg of that, that pyramid because we can learn from each branch. Each branch of our struggle has, has things that we can use at particular times in places that can help us move forward, right? Secondly, you know, we had freedom schools in the civil rights movement for our kids. We had liberation, OAU had liberation schools for adults and for children that taught them culture and politics. We need to take those spaces that we have for our kids and make sure we are giving them as much culture and as much information and as much organization, as much training as we can in leadership. That includes self-defense training. That includes self-defense training. 
And I ain't just talking about martial arts. I'm talking about every dimension of self-defense that's necessary for people who need to stay alive in a country that was built on two genocides. Right? So uh, all in, and that's, I'm about to go crazy. Let me, let me, let me bring it back in. <laughs> <laughs> bring it back. I don't know how to get it, right? But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, 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 so we, we're clear on the shoulders that we're standing on here. Mm -hmm. We're standing on Malcolm's shoulders and everything that is associated with those broad and incredible shoulders that he had. And, and we intend, to, we intend to, con to continue to carry that on. We want everybody to hold August 15th for Black August. Uh, we're trying to figure out September and in October, we were talking, just sharing some ideas before we actually you know, went live. We want to tighten those ideas up and really move forward. And uh, we want this to, this to continue. We want everyone who's watching this, use these as community political education. That's what it is. PE, as we called it for over the years, right? These, this is, these are political education tools that you can use. And everybody who is involved here is available to help you shape your own tools within your particular sets or organizations that you're trying to bring together. That's what the elders are for, right? Even those of us who are young elders, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which would be all of us. <laughs> yes, yeah, right? Each one of us. <laughs> so with that, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. We want everybody Absolutely. to stay all in the one in terms of the work that you are doing in your own respective lanes, places, and times. Uh, we look forward to the work that we want to build on, supporting each other. Terrence, we're, Terrence, we're really looking forward to what we can do to help you in Los Angeles. Uh, and if anybody's got a link on, on, on two elders who I'm trying to track down, I want you to holler at me. Elder Oba Tishaka and Alice Wyndham. I'm trying to get hold of them badly. So if anybody's got a, a link, Ilya, you do? Right on. Uh, it looks like Torrance has a, a link maybe to... Um... Well, Oba's been on the West Coast for years. And, you know, he's, yeah, and he's been I... one of the pioneers of Black Studies. And his, the political legacy of Malcolm X was one of the first important books coming from our community after the assassination that has been forgotten about that needs to be rediscovered. He's a master teacher, right? Yes, brother. I have, I have his phone number. If it hasn't changed, I have his phone number. Right on. Let's, let's right. Do what we got to do. I have his email address going back about five years ago. <laughs> yes, right on. Okay, so yeah. So, so the work is in front of us. <laughs> you know, forward is the motion. We appreciate everybody, you know, and we'll see you the next time. We'll see you in the whirlwind. Thank you, everyone. It's I'm looking forward to it. Care. Bye, everyone. Yes. Everybody be safe. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hey, hello.